Good morning, everybody. We're so excited that you chose to join us for worship this morning. If you would please stand if you're able and let's focus all of our attention on worshiping God this morning. Hello, everybody. 
Welcome to the Open Door Christian Church. Thanks for being with us today. If this is your first time, relax, have fun, get some coffee, enjoy the worship. It's fantastic, isn't it? Let's give them a quick hand. Thanks for choosing to worship with us today. If you haven't been here before or you've been here a whole bunch, you know we're about three things. Number one is we're about God's Word, the Bible. Our messages come straight out of the Bible. We take God's Word, take it seriously. We want to unpack it for you guys and bring it to your life so you can apply it and live it out. Second thing we're about, we're about prayer. We have prayer stations in the corners. Come and visit them. Join them. Pray for whatever you need to pray for. Intercede with somebody. Uh, if you need to pray for your mom, your grandma, your kids, take them over. Enjoy it. Third thing is, we're about worship. These guys aren't up here for a concert. They're not here just to perform. They're here to allow us to enter into worship through music. I'm so grateful for that. That speaks to me. It's fantastic. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today. Holy Spirit, we're so excited for you to join us today. Fall in this place. Be a part of every lyric, every word, everything Pastor Steve says. Lift the veil that's covering our eyes to see what it is you want us to see today about your truth. Be with us as we walk through a message that's challenging. It's about you so we can grow and know more of who you are. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
name 
I'd invite you all to be seated. That's what we're going to talk about for the next little while here. We're going to talk about Jesus. Talk about the name of Jesus. We're going to talk about what Paul in Colossians tells us about Jesus. Last week I challenged you with the question, have you been changed since you met Jesus? If you're a Christian, what about you is different? What about your life is different now from before you met Jesus? The question really doesn't change. But we're going to add to it because Paul today goes deep. He gets heavy. It's important. It's timely. Because Paul's talking about false teaching that has worked its way into this young church in Colossae. The Bible doesn't tell us what the false teaching is, but we get a pretty good idea of what it might be. We'll talk about that in a moment. But what Paul does is Rather than discrediting the messenger or wiping out the teaching, what he does is he lifts up the truth. He talks about what really, really is going on with Jesus and who Jesus is. So as we look at Paul's response to this false teaching today, we're going to get a very good grip on the big picture of the good news of Jesus. We we tell you all the time, you know, Go tell your friends. Go, go tell your coworkers, your family. Why do you believe what you believe? Who is Jesus to you? And so often we say, I don't know the Bible well enough to be able to do that. They're going to ask me questions that I can't answer. Well, Paul today, in just a matter of a few verses, is really going to give us enough to understand that we can just take this little bit out and we can be a part of seeing God God change somebody's life because what Paul is talking about is who Jesus really is. Not what the world says, but who he really is. Gives us a great example of how do we handle when someone doesn't agree with us, wants to argue, wants to pick a fight with who Jesus is. I'll tell you right off the bat, don't be offended. Don't feel like you need to fight. You don't need to argue. You don't need to to be the one that comes up with the right answer to to bring them back in line. Here's why. Because what you've got on your side that they don't have on theirs. If you believe in Jesus and they say that he doesn't exist or he isn't real or there is no God, here's what you've got. You've got the everlasting truth, the unchanging truth of God's word on your side. You don't need to fight. You don't need to argue. What you do need to do is to honor, share, and live God's truth the way that we talk about it, the way that we read it in the Bible. That's all that God asks from us. You're going to see what Paul doesn't do, and that is he he doesn't discredit or or refute the messenger. In fact, he really doesn't even talk about it. It's why we're not really sure what the, the heresy that he's writing about is. Instead, what he does is he lifts up the truth of Jesus. He lifts up who Jesus is and what it is to be a believer in him, and he lets the good news of Jesus stand for itself. And what Paul is aware of is something that we all need to get a grip on, and that is simply this, that when it comes to God and the Bible, God doesn't need you to defend him. All that God asks for is your testimony. Know what's there, know who I am, and tell other people about it. And that's what Paul's doing. That's what we get to read about today. See, there is no other story to God. There's no rest of the story, this idea of a hidden truth. And that's probably the heresy that Paul was really addressing was that there was more to the story. You folks don't know all of it is more than likely what those early Christians were hearing. It's a 2,000-year-old thing. It's, it's called Gnosticism. That's the belief. Gnosis is the word, and it's that there's a hidden truth, that there's a hidden knowledge that somehow out there, there's more to the story than what we've been given. It's kind of a way that a few people say there's a hidden knowledge that the rest of you don't have. It's only been revealed to a few of us. Well, the fact is, that just isn't true. It isn't true, and we know that because God's Word is open to everyone. 
You can go on Amazon, you can go to a bookstore, you can go all over the place, and you can get a very good, very reliable copy of the Bible, and there is God's Word right there for you to read. There's nothing being hidden. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone's going to understand it. It doesn't mean that everyone that hears it or reads it is going to accept it. The Bible says that clearly. In fact, Jesus says that he speaks in a way sometimes that not everybody would understand him. But does that mean that there's a deeper, hidden, secret truth about God that's being withheld? No, there isn't. God is present and available and loving to every single person in his creation. But this idea of Gnosticism, this hidden knowledge that there's, there's more truth than what we're aware of, it still sneaks its way into our world today. When you're told that there's many ways to God, you just don't know all of them, that all paths lead the same place, that it doesn't matter what you believe, believe it well, it all goes to God. It's, it's as though there's truth out there that you're not aware of. As a Christian, it would make you believe that we're hiding something from you, but God isn't. There's one way to God, and that's through his son, Jesus. If you've ever been taught that you're supposed to pray to somebody else, whether it's Mary, to a saint, to the angels, rather than approaching the throne of God directly through his son Jesus, that's a little bit of Gnosticism. It's a little bit of there's more that you understand. Well, there isn't. In fact, what it does is it puts dead people in the place of God. That's just not truth. So on to our text and what Paul's got to say about Jesus. And if you're a note taker, get your notebooks ready. Clear out a couple of pages. Not because of what I got to say, but because of what Paul's got to say. Today's going to be some heavy lifting. Paul gives us really good stuff, but it's dense and it's going to take us a while to chew on. Going to Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, 15th verse, talking about Jesus. Paul says this, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Paul's referring to what we call the incarnation of Christ. It is God coming to earth in the form of a human baby. What do we call that? The celebration is Christmas. And baby Jesus arrived fully God and became fully human. We don't understand that because we're, we're fully human ourselves, but we can begin to get a glimpse because we're also eternal. We're also created to be eternal beings. See, we've got this one life to choose where it is that we're going to spend our eternity. And that's why this letter that Paul writes is so very important. You get this one life to decide where it is that you want to spend eternity. See, the word, the Son of God, came in the form of a human baby named Jesus so that we could know God personally. That God wasn't an idea, wasn't some abstract thought that somebody created, but Jesus, the man, is the living image of the invisible God the very real, living, and invisible God. Paul goes on and he says that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. we got to park on that one for a moment because that can be confusing. There's another heresy that gets started in this one. Jesus, the Son of God, as God, was neither born nor created. When Jesus was born as a baby, he was born as a human, but he never gave up his divinity. He never gave up the God in him. It's who he is. So the incarnation is Jesus' birth as a human baby, but Jesus has existed as God for all eternity. There's this teaching out there that's been around about as long as this book has. It's called Arianism, and it's the idea that, well, Jesus was not God. He was fully human. When he came to earth, that's all he was. He was created by God, and therefore he's subordinate to and less than God the Father. And that isn't true. The Bible tells us that isn't true all the way from literally the very beginning to the end. When Paul is talking about this, he uses the Greek word prototokos when he describes who Jesus is. We translate that best, and it still isn't very complete, as the word preeminent. You probably don't use the word preeminent in conversation very often. It's a confusing one. It means that Jesus is sovereign over all creation. It, it, it might be best for us to try to understand it as He's the greatest thing that there's ever been. Muhammad Ali used to say he was the greatest. Yeah, unfortunately, you know what? That, that doesn't last for very long. But Jesus is preeminent. He truly is the greatest. And he has lasted forever and he will last forever as God. 
See, Paul is refuting the teaching that Jesus is only a man because he appeared to be a man. See, what you need to know is that the Bible is very clear that Jesus is fully God and has always been, even though he spent time on this earth as a human. And, and that's confusing. And you might go, I don't get it. How, how can Jesus be fully God and fully human all at the same time? I mean, you're one or the other. So here's what I got to say to hopefully make, hopefully make you feel a little better. That is why God is God and you are not. We get the chance to spend our lives trying to understand and then we go to heaven, and God will just turn on that light bulb, and we'll go, oh, that's how you did it. That was cool. But what we need to know is that the Bible tells us, that the Bible promises and assures us that when Jesus was born as a human baby, he was fully human. But for, throughout his entire life on earth, he was also fully God. And if you don't understand that any better than I do, then you can just be grateful like I am that God is God. Verse 16. For by him, by Jesus, the Son of God, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Where the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Every earthly institution, every monarchy, every king, every everybody out there was created through Jesus. Everything that we see and all of the things that God created that we have never seen were created by and for and through Jesus. Might help us to go back to John, the first chapter in the Gospel of John. He helps us understand this a little bit. John says this, in the beginning was the Word, and we know the Word was the Son of God. And the Word was with God, so the Word was, was separate from God, but, but still was there with God. And it says the word was God. So Jesus is fully God, and when he is born, he is fully human. But Jesus is a part of God. He is God. He was in the beginning with God. He always existed. He was never created. It doesn't say that God first created the Son of God. No, no, no. It says that he was there with him in the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning of time. That's where we step in. But the Son, the Holy Spirit, and God existed far before there was the beginning. We're about to read the creation came into existence through him. Verse 3, all things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. Bible makes that very clear that God created everything and everyone, and all of it was created in and through Jesus. And how did God create everything? If you go back to the book of Genesis, God did something that was just crazy simple. God did what? He spoke. And things began to be created. And when you speak, what is it that you word to, use to speak? You use words. And in the beginning was the word, the spoken word of God. What has come into being, it says, in him was life. There was no life outside the word, the Son of God. In the beginning was God, and we know that the Spirit moved over the waters and we know that the Son of God, the Word, was there, and all of creation was created in and through Him. It goes on in verse 4, And the light, the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness did not overcome it. There have been books in recent years. One of them was called The Secret. One of them was called Love Wins. There's others. And I, I said I wasn't going to pick on this person anymore, and so technically I'm not going to. But they've been really big hits with the Oprah crowd. You know the kind of book I'm talking about? I'll leave Oprah there. They're really big hits because they're all about us. They're all about what we do. They're all about what we believe and, and what we create. And the secret says it's the law of attraction. It's the greatest thing in the universe. And if you just believe it enough, it will just, boom, come to you. Really? Have you tried it? How many of you won the lottery? Point taken. One. We got one lottery winner. See, we like those books because we want to believe that the universe revolves around us, that we're the most important thing there. But all of those are lies. They're absolutely nothing short of lies. And, and, and why are they lies? Because we know that they're not true because there's no secret out there. That's Gnosticism. What there is is the unchanging, enduring, everlasting Word of God. 
The premise of love wins is that there's no hell because a loving God would never send someone to hell. A a loving God would never make anyone go to hell. I I got news for you. You've got one life to make a major decision, and it will have implications that will last for all of eternity. Here is the decision you have to make. Do you or do you not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, your only hope, your one opportunity to have your sins forgiven, to be the Savior of your life, to be the Lord of your life, And if you put your faith and hope and trust and live for him, heaven is your eternity. And if you say during this life, I don't believe in God. I don't need that religious crutch. I'm not going to believe that old book. You have the opportunity to believe that. You can choose to believe that there is no hell and that there's no God and that none of it exists, and God loves you enough that he gives you the right to make that decision, and you will find out how wrong you were. A loving God doesn't send anyone to hell. God who loves us allows us to spend eternity in the place of our choosing. And you need to get that straight, because people say, I don't believe in hell because a loving God would never send anyone there. A loving God wants no one to go there. A loving God sent his only son to die for the sins even of the people who say they don't believe because it doesn't mean that Jesus wasn't true. And so we go to the place that is of our choosing. And so maybe you choose to believe in this this godless universe that loves you and that there is no hell and that the secret to spiritual truth and happiness is found in yoga. God loves you enough he'll let you believe that. God loves you enough that he'll let you live your whole life believing that. And God will send you all kinds of signs and messengers and people to let you know that it isn't true, but he will allow you to hold on to that if you want to. God will let you believe and do all of those things just the way that you want. But you know what? No matter how much you believe them, it doesn't make any of them true. It doesn't make any of them real. The light in the darkness of this world is Jesus, the word of God, period. And the reason Paul writes this impassioned letter is he wants the people of the church in Colossae to understand that you get one chance, one chance to cling to the light and the darkness because the world around us is dark. Verse 17, and he is, being Jesus still, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus existed as God before anything else existed outside of God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus was there. Before there was anything else, there was God. And then Paul says this, and I love it. Jesus is the glue that holds it all together. Jesus is the glue that holds it all together. We've got this phrase that we use as people when things aren't going very well. We say, man, my life is falling apart. I'm just coming unglued. Maybe just... As a thought, do you need more Jesus? Jesus is the glue that holds everything together. That includes you and I. If he can hold the universe together, if it all came into existence in and through him, you know what? He can hold you together. Verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he must be preeminent. There we have firstborn and preeminent again. When we talk about the leader of the church as Jesus around here, we really mean that. We really mean that the leader of this place is Jesus. And my job as the senior pastor and our pastoral staff and and our staff and our ministry leaders, you know, all of us, our, our responsibility along with the elders is to make sure that we're not doing the stuff that we want to do that we think is a good idea. We want to make sure we're doing the things that God has called us to that are in his will for this place, because this isn't our church, this is his church. We want to be responsible to follow God's lead and and not run off doing things that might be great ideas, but that are outside of God's call for us. See, God has a will for us as leaders of the church, and we want to make sure that we follow it. Why? Because Jesus is the head of our church family. Then Paul goes on. He says that Jesus is the beginning. Why is he the beginning? Well, the beginning of what time? Well, that makes sense if you realize that Jesus was there 
as the word that caused all things to come into being. And when there was a night and a day, suddenly there was time. Jesus was there at the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning of creation. But he was there long before the beginning of creation. When it says he's the firstborn from the dead, what does that mean? It means that God raised Jesus from the grave to a new life so that we might be raised to a new life. What does that mean? That not even death has power over him. And for that matter, it doesn't even have power over us. Because we know the one that created everything that is also has created a place for everyone who will believe in him. Because of all that, Paul says, Jesus is preeminent. Strange word, it means he's the greatest. He was before all, he's above all. He was first, but he was not created. He was not created by God because he is God. He existed as God prior to everything else. And in him and through him, everything that is was created and came into being for him. That's why I said we're going to talk about Jesus today. Verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. When Jesus was baptized, a really cool thing happened. Jesus had never sinned, right? He never did. But as an example to us, as a model for us, Jesus stepped forward to John and he said, you need to baptize me. And John said, hey, not me. And Jesus said, yep. And Jesus was baptized. And when Jesus came out of the water, it says in Matthew 3, 16, when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, Suddenly the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. So you've got Jesus the Son, you've got the Holy Spirit coming in something that looked like a dove and alighting on him and a voice from heaven, this is God, Creator, Father, said, this is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. All of God existed in that place, in that moment, in a way the people around could at least see, if not hear. The image of the invisible God, the voice of the invisible God, and Holy Spirit of the invisible God, all at one place. And Jesus heard from his Father that he was pleasing to him. Why? Because he had been obedient. And what did that obedience mean? That obedience mean that Jesus would be obedient to his Father throughout his life, all the way up to and including his death. And God said that he was pleased. The fullness of godly divinity existed in Jesus, fully human, and yet there he was, the living image of the invisible God. Verse 20, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. If you had to choose one verse that explained why Jesus came to earth, that's it. There is your explanation. See, we live on an earth that's been polluted by something far worse than the pictures that we see of plastic floating in the oceans. Far worse than an overproduction of an industrial gas and waste. We live in a world that has been overrun with the pollution of human sin. We hear an awful lot about global warming and what it's doing to the planet and it's gonna be the end of human civilization. But I got news for you, the real problem that we face the real problem that we face is a lot older and runs a lot deeper than a few cows and their methane toots. The real problem is the pollution that's caused by human sin. And yet we don't talk about that. We don't talk about human sin and how it's polluting the world. The real problem that faces humanity is our own sinfulness, sin that is dismissed and legalized and laughed at and ignored. And, and you know the thing that gets me? You don't hear anybody laughing about the plastic that's floating in the ocean. Nobody laughs about the garbage that's pooling up in different places and, and, and destroying our oceans. Nobody laughs about that. Why then do we laugh about sin? Why do we laugh about the thing that is literally killing us as we breathe? We don't laugh about plastic in the oceans because it isn't funny. But human sin isn't funny either. H human sin is no laughing matter. And yet it makes us so uncomfortable. 
There's a guy named Tim Tebow. He was a professional football player for a while, a very good one, a quarterback, a phenomenal athlete. Tim Tebow will likely never play the game of football again because he's honest about his faith in Jesus. He's honest about how he feels about God's word and God's truth. And, and every time anybody wants to interview Tim Tebow, which just doesn't happen much anymore, he talks about Jesus. Why has he been run out of the NFL? Why does the media dismiss a pastor or a celebrity or someone who, for whatever reason, might be noteworthy in another sense? Why do they completely dismiss them because they might speak something about sin or repentance? I'll tell you why. Because even to an unbelieving world, it makes us uncomfortable. We don't want to be accountable. We don't want someone to tell us that we're doing something that we shouldn't and we're accountable to God for those actions. And so we just simply ignore them, we laugh at them, and we don't listen to them. See, people don't want to believe in a loving God who hates the way our sin destroys us and our relationships with him and separates us from our creator. We don't want to hear about that. And so God sent his only son, Jesus, in whom the Bible says, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in order to reconcile, to make right and whole himself with us. And what needed to be made right? The price and the penalty of our sin, of course. What does it mean to reconcile, to make right and whole? Do you realize that in Jesus, God did everything for you? All that he's waiting for you is to say, I believe. I recognize that I'm a sinner and I realize that I'm, I'm powerless outside of the Holy Spirit at work in my life. God reconciled himself. He did all the work on our behalf on the cross in the death of Jesus. The only Son of God, the perfect Savior, the Lamb of God who died in our place and died for our sins so that if we would only recognize and acknowledge the truth of who God is, the truth of who Jesus is as our Savior, that our only hope for this life of sin is to accept him for who he is and live our lives for him. Why did God do all that? So that we wouldn't perish in our sin, but through the blood that Jesus shed, shed on the cross, he died for us so that we might live. That makes too many people uncomfortable. Because to get there, you've got to talk about sin and you've got to recognize and accept the fact that we all do. See, Paul wants this church in Colossae and we want this church to understand that the good news of Jesus is God's response to the sin of humanity. Jesus is the perfect divine and the only answer to the problem of human sin, yours, mine, and everyone else's. There is no other way around it. There's no other way through it or over it or outside of it. You can find ways to make yourself feel better. You can think more positively. You can give yourselves to some purpose that's outside of, outside of your normal life. That's why so many books have been written and religions have been started is to create other ways that make us feel better about ourselves. What we can't do is to work, think, or wish ourselves beyond the very present reality of our own sin. You can ignore it, try to fix it, you can try to move past it. You can do what a lot of people do, and that's to embrace it. Just learn to be comfortable dancing with your demons. America, we started doing something that's really interesting. We've chosen to start passing laws. And we've got folks out there who will shame anyone who disagrees with the angry agendas being carried forward that are nothing more than those lies of the devil. But here is the truth. You can call sin whatever you want. You can even legalize sin. But you know what? In the eyes of God, sin is still sin. And here's the thing that makes me the most sad. When we no longer call something sin, even if we go to the extent of legalizing it, it will make some people feel better. But you know what will not do is will not give us the opportunity ever to give them the chance to be blessed with forgiveness. Because if you're not sinning, there's no need for repentance. And, and if your sin is suddenly legal, then you're free and clear. No one's got anything to say about you. And by God reconciling himself to us, 
part of that process is recognizing our own sinfulness and apologizing, repenting, turning from it, and receiving a word of forgiveness. And when we legalize sin, and when we ignore sin, and when we just gallantly run past sin, there's no hope of forgiveness because people don't think they're doing anything wrong. What's the greatest tragedy that's happening in America? Nothing more than that. There's no true forgiveness. There's no true peace. And our hearts will never rest outside of a personal relationship with Jesus who came as the perfect, sinless Son of God to reconcile us back to God after we chose sinful rebellion over our Redeemer. And what we're doing in America and churches are jumping on the bandwagon is saying, it isn't sin, it's okay. And it's a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not talking about just one thing. It's a whole bunch of stuff. And when we say that it isn't sin as churches and when we legalize it as a nation, there is no more forgiveness. And I have to imagine that the heart of God is absolutely weeping over what we've done. So where are you with Jesus today? Who is he to you? I used to be at a church and there was a guy there and he used to walk around. Man, he made people feel uncomfortable. He'd come up to you. I don't care if he just met you. He'd say, hey, my name is so-and-so. How are you and Jesus getting along? And a handful of people say, great. Well, let's talk about it. How are you and Jesus getting along? Yeah, maybe okay. Let's talk about it. How are you and Jesus getting along? I don't believe in him. Ha <laughs> ha, let's talk about it. He made people feel incredibly uncomfortable because he asked the right question. How are you and Jesus getting along? Does Jesus know you by the sound of your voice? Do you know Jesus by the sound of his voice to you? Or are you still trying to work your way around and through and over your sin? Or have you given your sin and the rest of your life over to the one who came to reconcile you back to your creator? Because what he's really doing is he's making the way clear for you to come home. So how are you and Jesus getting along? Where are you with Jesus as the Lord of your life? You might say, I appreciate that forgiveness factor. That's pretty cool. Jesus is Savior. We're getting along great. How are you and Jesus as the Lord of your life getting along? Do you still retain control of your life? If you do, you continue to die in your sinfulness. But if you say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want to submit my life to you. I want to live for you from here on out. You've given yourself over to the one then who came to you to die for your sinfulness because he loves you that much. How are you and Jesus doing today? Maybe you say, I don't really know him. I, I, I couldn't answer that question. I, 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 don't, I don't know him. He doesn't know the sound of my voice, and I've never bothered to try to listen to him. You know what? Today's maybe your day because here's the news. And I'm not trying to scare you. I don't go for that kind of stuff. But here's the fact. You got one or two destinations when this life is over and it will end for you just like it will for me. You get heaven or hell. It's your choice. God loves you so much that he lets you make that decision for yourself. And then as much as it breaks him, his heart to allow people to go to their place of their choosing, if that place is hell, he allows you to go. If you don't know Jesus... That's not where you want to end up. We've got folks that will be in the prayer corners after the, the service. They'd love to talk to you. They'd love to pray with you. You know, you, you can make that simple acknowledgement, Jesus, I've, I've done it for myself long enough. Today I'm ready to start doing it for you. How are you and Jesus getting along? Maybe you go, went to church as a, as a kid and you've kind of strayed and, and you believe in him. You, want, you, you accept all that. You don't argue with any of this, but you haven't been living for him. Maybe today is your day to come back home. Guess what? we got prayer people that would love to pray with you. Or maybe you say, you know what? Jesus and I are getting along great. We've been doing really well. Then I, then I would say to you, that, that's awesome. What else is he calling you to? Who is he calling you to be? And so, who is Jesus to you? Let's pray. God, thank you for the wisdom that you put into Paul that he could write a letter like this to a church and make things heavy but clear. 
thank you, God, for your love for us that you sent your only son. You sent Jesus to live as a human in all the ways that as God you are not limited. And Jesus lived as a human and he died as a human all the while holding on to his divinity with you because you love us. And God, our sinfulness makes us so uncomfortable that we choose to laugh at it because we don't know what else to do. But you chose to confront it. You confronted it with the only thing that it is deserving, and that is death. But it wasn't our death, it was your son's death. Help us to understand, to acknowledge, to accept the free gift of forgiveness and salvation that you give to us in Jesus, wherever we are today. God, that your Holy Spirit would grab a hold of us, that you would be real, that Jesus would be real, that our sin would be real, and that our need for forgiveness would be real. God, we give you thanks for what it is that you have done, what it is that you are doing, and what it is that you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'd invite you to stand. We're going to uh, welcome the ushers forward. We're going to receive our morning's gifts and tithes and offerings. And, uh, you know, I used to say this a lot, and I haven't done it so much anymore. If you're a guest or a visitor here this morning, we're really glad you showed up to worship with us. Thank you for being here. Um, those of us who call this our church home, we're the ones who have accepted the responsibility to give back to God and to, to fuel with finances the ministry that God has called us to in this place. And what God asks is that we would be generous and we would give with glad hearts. And so uh, if you're a, a visitor, you know what these, these velvet things were about. To, if, if you want to, you can just let those pass right by and we're just glad that you're here. The rest of us, we know that it's our privilege to give back to God because we know that everything we have is a gift from God in the first place. And so let's continue with music. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high, and I will praise Him. He is exalted. Ever exalted, and I will praise his name.
Hey, a couple of announcements. Tonight, 6 p.m., I'm not going to forget this service. Tonight at 6 p.m., night of worship. I almost forgot that at 8.30. That would have been bad. If you've never been a part of our night of worship, you want to be here. Set aside what you're doing. Have dinner early. Have dinner late. Be here at 6 o'clock. It's going to be about 90 minutes of all worship, and it is awesome. So please make plans to be here. Also, next Sunday, it is going to be sunny and hot and perfect for baptisms. Yeah, so we're going to do after this service right down on our beach at noon. If you know that you want to be baptized next Sunday, if you would talk to Lori, please, to let her know so we can get your name down. And if you show up next Sunday and say, you know what, God is moving me, and today is my day to step out in obedience, and I want to let the world know that I believe in Jesus. You know what, next Sunday might be your time. So that will be right after services at noon. Also, Jeff, Jeff is standing back there. Jeff would love to have you sign up. For life groups, the new life group is beginning this Thursday in Spicer. Did I get that all correct? Stop by and talk to Jeff. Thursday nights? You're really getting confusing on me, Jeff. Two groups that are meeting are going to continue to meet on Monday. New group is going to meet on Thursday. How would I do? I quit. <laughs> and then... Valor, are you here for VBS? Valor's back here. You know what? If you've got young people that want to be a part of VBS, or if you're a not-so-young person and you want to just be around young people and help out, we would love to know about that. Sign-ups are back there. Uh, running four weeks starting July 10th through the four weeks of July. We'd love to have you as a part of all that. Uh, here is my last thing that I want to leave you with. Paul says, Jesus is preeminent. Jesus is superior. He's the greatest Jesus is above all and through all, before all, and will be after all. But what is preeminent in your life? What is your highest priority? What is the most important thing in your world? All I want to leave you with this, if it isn't Jesus, why not? If Jesus isn't most important to you, why? With that, night of music, tonight... Night of Worship, 6 p.m. Thank you for coming. Uh, we'll ha be here again Wednesday night, 6.30 for Growing Deeper, and then next Sunday, 8.30 and 10.30. Thanks for being here, folks. Thanks for worshiping with us. Have an awesome week. One more song. Let's go. This is a preview to it tonight. Ready? You are here.
Amen? We serve a living God who loves you so much and you want to share it with the world. What a great opportunity to invite them to night of worship tonight. Have a great day. Wherever you are, there's freedom. I can feel it breaking out. The walls are coming down right now. Jesus. 